Kave, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Do you have a favorite quote, something that inspires or motivates you that you can share with us? Yeah, I actually don't. I'm not big on quotes. Um, uh, but uh, there's one I think is very good that we think a lot about when thinking about planet, building planet. And it's, we say that nothing of value comes easy. And I think that that's very true, at least for from my experience and experience of building this company. So tell us about Plan Hat. What does the product do? Who's it for? And what's the main problem you're helping to solve? So Plan Hat is a customer platform uh, built to retrain, retain and grow and service your customers. So you can think of it as like a post sale CRM. Uh, that we built. Um, uh, maybe a bit more uh, nerdier way of thinking about it is that it's a time series CRM uh, built for customers to understand their uh, full sort of customer life cycle and give the, give the help give their customers a better experience. Yeah, who are your typical customers? Maybe some some logos. So well, you know, we um, uh, we sell to data driven companies. So we're starting out, we sell a lot to SaaS software companies. Uh, but we also have a lot of customers in healthcare, MSPs, uh, services companies, uh, service uh, security companies, and whatnot. Um, and interesting with our platform and our business is that we serve sort of both the SMBs, fairly smaller smaller companies, uh, up to very big, large uh, enterprise companies. Cool. And give us a sense of the size of the business. Where are you in terms of revenue, number of customers, size of team? Yeah, so we are roughly 200 people, um, you know, split between uh, both revenue and employees is, uh, in both uh, EMEA Europe and North America. We're eight-figure business in ARR and um, uh, we're growing. And I think you guys have raised about 50 million now, right? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, the background of the company is that we were bootstrapped uh, for a fairly long time. Uh, we raised the $50 million dollars. Uh, a few years ago, and but sort of the bootstrap mentality has not disappeared. So, company still has roughly fifty million dollars in the bank, and you know, operating similar to be, to before. So, when you say bootstrap for a long time, how, how how long are we talking about? Oh man, the first six years of the company was a bootstrap, so a fairly uh, fairly long time. That's a, that's a bootstrap business, right? Like some people say, uh, we bootstrap for the first six months, right? But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the first two weeks, yeah. yeah, exactly. Cool. Okay, great. So before we get into like where the idea for this business came from, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background because I think that's pretty relevant to like how you know Plan Hat came about. So like, where what were you doing before this business? What's your background? I work for, um, so I've done, I, I say to people, I've um, to kind of done two things in my life. One is that I was used to be a fighter uh, before studying and go to school um, at the university. But um, after school, the university, I joined a, you know, a software SaaS startup, a fairly small company back in the day uh, from Scandinavia, Swedish myself. And um, this is now, I think, 19, uh, soon 20 years ago. Uh, so yeah, that's how I learned business, uh, by working in software and SaaS. I joined that company when it was fairly small and I was there for a long time and helped uh, to grow the company. Uh, it was, a uh, yeah, it was a SaaS business fairly early on, you know, uh, thought about, um, you know, fighting churn, selling deals, entering new markets and whatnot for, for, for a long time. So you founded Plan Hat with uh, your co-founder Nicholas. Where did the idea come from? Yeah, so um, as I said, so I was working um, in a SaaS business, right? Um, and I was in charge of go-to-market teams. I was in charge of the customer success team there. And at a fairly young age, uh, I was managing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in in ARR and try to fight churn and reduce re to reduce churn, do more upselling, grow grow revenue from existing customers and whatnot. And um, um, you know, they're thinking about the problem a lot that um, the problem of gross and net retention or problem slash opportunity of of improving gross and net retention becomes bigger over time. Um, and, 
you know, try to solve this by a bunch of different things. I'm, I don't have a technical background, so, you know, try to solve it by, uh, you know, ad- addressing it through different salary models for post-sale functions from, you know, a bunch of different playbooks and just trying a million different things to solve gross net retention. Um, so, you know, identifying that, like, at the core, this problem has to do with customer centricity, uh, uh, you know, where companies typically, when they're growing, they're thinking that, you know, sales is typically king in a company. Sales is king. You typically see a lot of companies as they're growing and scaling quickly, selling bad deals or non-bad fit deals to their customers. Uh, and as the company grows, you know, uh, net revenue retention becomes this key metric in companies. Uh, sort of seeing that and also seeing that this is very much a technology problem. Um, a time-based problem that you need to sort of understand your customer data uh, over time uh, and need to make sure that everybody in the company have access to customer data and whatnot. So um, so that's sort of from um, thinking about this problem. And also Niklas, my co-founder, is an amazing guy. Um, uh, you know, has a math background, national chess player, uh, went on to be a management consultant and done a lot of really interesting things. Um, and he sort of came to this a bit more from a technical perspective. He also worked in SaaS and software for a long time and tried to solve for similar things, but by thinking about technology first and building products and technology for these things. So, you know, you have uh, one co-founder coming from this sort of from a commercial background, the other one from a technical background and uh, be like, hey, like this is a, this is a problem. Like yeah, a lot of the, CRMs and technologies out there, they're sort of mainly transactional systems built to help companies close deals, not necessarily to uh, grow existing customers over time. Okay, great. So you've you've seen the pain firsthand. You guys feel that this is a problem worth solving. How did you get started? Did you go out and do the whole, let's let's validate this idea, let's find you know, customers, potential customers to interview, or was it more about let's start building the product? Like, how did you guys start? Yeah, no, it wasn't uh, research-based for sure. It was, Niklas was, we met many years ago, and Niklas was on paternity leave. And we were like, yeah, like, this is a problem. And then Niklas, you know, being a techie, he, he was like, I'll start building on this thing and let's see what comes out of it. So validating, I would say that, no, like we weren't out there researching and, interviewing companies because we sort of felt this ourselves firsthand for many years, felt the pain deeply, right? So it was very pragmatic, like, hey, let's start to build the uh, first version of this thing, see if we like it ourselves, if it works, uh, and then sort of take it to market. Now, what was interesting for us was that very early on, we started to get a lot of inbounds because you know it was obvious that it wasn't only us thinking that this is our problem. Um, that the CRM sort of weren't sufficient enough for this for this problem. So a bunch of inbounds and, you know, Plan has had this bootstrap story, but we had a, I remember that we had a very important customer fairly early on that invested in the company by buying the product and helping, helping to sort of shape the product. So that came from, from fairly early days. We had customers signing on and, and try to, you know, uh, uh, address this with the product that we started to build. How are they finding you? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Websites, SEO. I usually say that if you um, if you build a good product, people will find you uh, in the era of internet. <laughs> um, but yeah, but yeah. So it was. I, I can't think that of that we did. There wasn't much SEO or uh, paid advertisement that we did. It was we had a website out. And, you know, maybe there was some blog posts out there, but, you know, uh, yeah, people, people, people found us. Yeah. So I, I know that in, in the early days, I mean, one of the, 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 the biggest challenges that founders have at this stage is figuring out who is their ICP and, and you know, what's the target market. And I know you, you guys got to a point where you were very focused on who that buyer was and a very specific problem in terms of like, uh, you know, net revenue retention, but how, how did, how did that come about? Like, how did you figure out who your ICP was? What 
industry you were going to go after like um it, it again it's it's a pretty broad problem you're solving here and there's a lot of you know saas businesses out there and and or you know and already doing any kind of subscription type business how how do you how do you how do you focus in so they know when they come across the product that this is what they need like how did you go through that process when we started out we thought about the the product and we still sort of think about the product as a as solving something much bigger than solving for churn right we thought about it like hey you know you have this big uh, you know big big uh, company salesforce with their crm sitting in all these companies it's a big system it's clunky it's super expensive and uh, like we're like hey the world needs something else and uh, uh, let, let's build some uh, platform you know inspired by salesforce but that where we look at instead of having sort of the opportunity being center of the business and sales being king making sure that the customer is center of the center of the business and making sure that everybody in the company can access information about the, the customer which is the most important thing you have in your business so um, that's how we started. And then we said, LA, okay, so let's start with sort of selling this thing to SaaS B2B companies that are scaling fast. So today we have customers, you know, telcos, healthcare businesses, uh, services businesses using Planet. But when we started that, we were thinking that, hey, hey our ACP is just SaaS B2B businesses that are scaling fast. And the problem we want to help them with is only to solve for uh, churn prevention, you know? Um, so that's how we started out. And that was a big, and still is a big enough, uh, problem for us and for our industry sort of to, to, to tackle. Um, so, so that's, that's how we started. And that, that was sort of the pitch. That was the, that was what the product was about early on or whatnot. But, but, you know, obviously as we grew, we saw that, Hey, this customer centricity and having access to customer data and managing customers, giving customers a great customer experience throughout the full life cycle. This is not just something that is important for SaaS B2B businesses. It's everywhere. Like it's Yeah. How long did it take to get those first 10 customers? That's a good question. I think even in the first year, we got the, the first couple of the customers. Uh, but I say like take 12 months, six, 12 months, the first uh, 10 customers. And obviously it was fair to say too, right, is that uh, Plan is a bigger company today, but like when you're a small company, you sell to other small companies. <laughs> That's what you do. When you're a bigger company, you sell to bigger companies, and um, so 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 yeah. And th I, you know, I think the you, you mentioned earlier about that you sell to SMBs and to enterprise businesses. Was that something that you set out? early on in, in terms of thinking about this as a enterprise type product, or at least was that the vision or did that come later? And, and in those early days, it was like our customer is like, whoever will buy this thing from us. Yeah, no, uh, I think that when you just, when you don't, day one, we just start out the first couple of weeks, months, obviously, whoever is willing to buy from you, you're happy. Um, right. Uh, but but that said, we were, uh, I mean, we, we when I say that we sell to SMBs, we don't sell to, you know, 10-man companies, 20-man companies. We, our, our product is not necessarily super cheap. So, so uh, we don't so, sort of solve the um, very small companies out there. Um, and early on, we, we did speak about that, hey, we, we think that our experience and knowledge sort of fits better if the company has um, some scale. So, you know, today I think the planet is good if you're at least, you know, 50, 100 employees and up. Uh, that was always been sort of that we, that that's where we want to operate. But if you're 100 people or less, then maybe planet is not always uh, a, a good fit for you. So, 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 you know, yes, early on, we said that we want to build an enterprise grade product. So that's always been important for us. Um you know, which is why we spend just all this time building out the technology and, and product and security and all the things that comes around it. If you want to serve uh, larger companies, Let, let's talk about that that journey to the first million in ARR. Ninety nine percent of the time, when I talk to founders and I'll say, "How did you grow?" or, or "What worked? What didn't work?" 
paid ads is always like top of the list. We tried paid ads, didn't work. Um, and I asked you that question and paid ads was like top of the list in terms of one of the things that did work for you guys. So just tell us about what, like, you know, how, how that worked for you and, and, uh, you know, how easy or hard was it to, to get that working as a growth channel for your business? Yeah. So pay that is definitely somewhere you can just spend a lot of money and don't see it's easy to spend money in, in, when it comes to pay that. Um, so I, I mean, obviously I, I know about our business. I don't know about all the businesses out there that, that you speak to, but in a B2B setting, typically you're building a software for some that you're sort of selling to some division head of a company. You know, you may have, you sell something to head of engineering, head of finance, head of, head of something, right? And uh, I think that uh, what, hel what helped uh, in this case was that we sort of deeply understood the people we were selling the product to. So, and if you fully understand the sort of the challenges or if you deeply understand the challenges that the buyer of such a product would have or the department head of that uh, function would have, then it's easier, I would say, to sort of tailor your messaging uh, both SEO and paid advertisement for for that for that buyer, and the the sort of more specific use cases you can you can connect your messaging to the better, and the more outcome based you are, the better. So I think that for us that was that was I mean that that helped a lot, you know. And and I say to a lot of people I meet, I say that hey nobody you know, nobody says that, hey, I don't want to invest in improving my NRR. Nobody says that, oh, I'm not interested. I don't want to improve my NRR. Like, no, that, that, that's not a, that's not something that we, that we hear a lot. Uh, so I think that, 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 that helps. You know, that together with like timing, targeting these ads and, and, and whatnot. And also we're not selling a product that is super cheap either, right? So if you pay X dollars to get the person to do a demo with you and your contract sizes are, fairly big again it's not ten dollars per month or something then then you can get get the math to work so so back in those days like typically what was the average contract value of this type of deal uh early and maybe first uh, one two years ten thousand dollars ish uh per year um and then yeah so i would say around at around 10k and and then up from there yeah so so you're using paid ads and you mentioned seo so uh, basically the hypothesis being that you know your ICP, they have this pain, they're probably searching for some kind of solution. So let's spend some ad dollars to get in front of them. Let's also do a great job with organic search uh, because then we don't have to pay for, for those clicks. And especially as a bootstrap business, right? This is not like you don't have a lot of money to blow on on paid ads. Once you were getting leads coming through these channels, what was happening? Uh, how easy or hard was it to to close these types of deals, and and who was doing the selling? You know, we one thing that I mean, obviously, I'm biased here, and but I think that we we have a great product. We've always had a great product. Obviously, it's way stronger today than it was day one or year one. Uh, but product has always been something that we have wanted to lead with. We say that, you know, we're a product company first and foremost. We take great pride in our technology. So we always say that, hey, if we get somebody to just see this damn thing, then they will buy. Like, it's a good product. It creates a lot of value. And, you know, it's, uh, as I said, like, if we help you to improve your net revenue retention, get faster time to uh, value, to you know, hire less people in your post-sale function, uh, and and scale well, you know, with our product more than you would do without our product. The, you know, it's it's an easy investment. It's easy to justify the investment. So um, I think that getting if you get to we got people to to view the product and get a demo of it and try it out a bit, then um, th then we typically always have done uh, re really well. Uh, the the times when we have not. You know, still today we don't do well. Is you know, if it's more around brand recognition or not getting the foot in the door in the in the first place. Um, so I would say that. In the early early days, who sold like uh, I know Niklas, our CTO co-founder, he sold deals even though he's an engineer. Um, so that's cool. I've sold deals, obviously, 
Uh, so anybody, we had a very flat organization early on. So you know, anybody that uh, we had people in customer success support selling deals early on. So and that helped. But obviously, for myself and Niklas being you know senior in the space and understanding the problem deeply and, and product really well, it's fairly easy to sell a deal, a ten thousand dollar deal, uh, in in early stages. And you know, so yeah. Cool. Uh, I know the other growth channel that worked well for you guys was just doing direct sales and cold calling and you made the point that cold calling is not dead um so what what were you doing there and and why do you feel that you you were able to have some success with just calling people so again like you know uh, what problems you're solving you have a pro hopefully a very good product competitive product and you have a buyer there you identified, you know, I, this is the person that's head of this department or function or the workflow that we can help or reduce cost or whatever it is that you can help the customer with. Just getting the fastest way from point A to point B is to get a hold of that person and get the person on a call or on a Zoom meeting and describe what you're doing and see if you can, you can be helpful. So uh, that has worked well for us. And uh, yeah. Um, you know, personally, I've been involved in a bunch of different companies uh, throughout the years as board members, uh, you know, early, early employee of uh, companies that grow to be very big, public companies, private companies, whatnot, like direct sales uh, works really well. It's a very efficient uh, if, if you get it, if you get it to work. But, but as you're saying, like, you know, it typically obviously starts with having a good product. And two, that you know who you're going to talk to uh, uh, about what. I think that it, it sounds very basic, but it's surprising how many companies, I think, or people struggling with, with that. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things where whether you're doing cold calling or cold email is like just, just the relevance, right? If, if, you're, if you're talking to the right person about the right problem, it's a much easier conversation than, you know, just kind of, you know, what did I say? Like spray and pray, right. In terms of, I'm just going to try and contact everybody and, and, and hope that there's somebody out there who might have this problem. And then the, uh, on all that too, right. It is, so if you're head of a function, like your job is to find ways of creating more efficiencies in your business. Part of the job is to buy software is to implement uh, methodologies or whatnot to, just make your team more efficient and grow faster, more profitable, and and whatnot. So, if the uh, yeah, if you're <laughs> seeing uh, the right person about the right things, like uh, it happens all the time. Yeah, people call me all the time. It it it. it uh, sometimes it works. How how did that play out once you started building a sales team? You're starting to hire salespeople. Um, was cold calling still part of the? kind of the, the, the plan? Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. But, uh, I would say that majority up until maybe just two, one, two years ago, majority of our sales was on inbound, uh, still. Um, so, uh, again, right. So we're, we're solving this fairly starting out. We started to solve this very niche problem, which is to improve the net revenue retention. We have a very good product, uh, great reviews, customers speaking well about us. Customers changing jobs and buying our product uh, again and again, and um, and uh, we are. I think what's important is that we're sort of operating in different markets, so we don't have a sales or go to market team sitting in California where I live and try to sell to companies all over the world or all regions or all you know countries. Uh, we have sort of this go-to-market motion where, and this is start where we started to hire uh, people in, on the uh, salespeople that, you know, if you're buying Plan Hat today in France, you speak to a French AE, you speak to French-speaking customer success managers or people that are implement your software. There's a person that speaks French that is head of that market. Uh, same thing if you're in Germany or you're in Scandinavia or in the UK or US or whatnot. So that localized approach has has always helped us uh, a lot you know so so that 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 has helped um 
I, I think that's one. And then, and then second thing is that like when you're doing, when you're looking to buy software like this, if you, again, like if you, if the people you speak to and is servicing you is just local to you, that this is something that we experience is, is helping a lot. Um, so, so was outbounding a strategy from early days? Yes, but it was enough, you know, obviously when you're a smaller company, if you do inbound well, there's enough to just um, focus on uh, for, for 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 the for the sales team in the early in the early days. But then, yes, as you know, we're hitting scale. You need to uh, have other channels helping out too. When I talk to founders who are you know on their journey to let's say the first million in ARR, there's often this assumption that you know you've got to be you, you got to have a ton of different growth channels. You got to be trying, you know, seven, eight, nine things, and and working all of these channels to to acquire customers. And one of the things that you had said earlier on when we were kind of preparing for this was, you know, focus on like just one or two channels. Uh, you know, even to get to like the first ten million in in ARR. So. Just, just kind of tell me about that. Just, just, just help, help, kind of rationalize that for somebody who's thinking, sort of very counter to to that 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 kind of point of view. I think it's easy when you start out that you have these, uh, I don't know, um, that you listen to all these advice from different people, and there's all you know, somebody was very successful with partnerships from inbound, outbound, uh, enterprise sales, PLG, and you and you get excited and you think that, well, it worked for those people, so you should work for me. I think that that's, um, I think focus is extremely important. Yeah, so uh, I think so. I think that two channels for the first $10 million in revenue, absolutely. I think that that's uh, plenty. Um, I do think that, again, like the, the, the place to start is to think about like, hey, like who am I solving a problem for? You know, and that needs to be extremely clear. And it shouldn't be a problem that only I think that I'm solving for the person, but the person is like, yeah, I'm head of whatever function in a company. Like, I think that this is a problem. I want to have a product or service that, you know, help me reduce costs doing this thing or or grow faster or, or whatever it is that, that, that they try to do, right? I think that nailing that early on is very important. And then nailing sort of the product, making sure that the va- the product is actually creating value and is not something that you think is creating value that like it's actually creating value. Um, I think, I think, I think, it, I mean, I appreciate that it sounds very basic, but like get, spending time getting that right, then experimenting with 10 different channels. I think that I would focus more on, on, on the first. Uh, now, um, the in a B2B setting again, in a B2B setting, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of companies going PLG. Some people, companies starting out, they just want to serve the enterprise or mid-market or whatnot. Um, I think that like companies should, um, I think it's good if you sort of focus on the segment where you feel that you have, maybe as the founding team or the first couple of employees in the, in the company, you feel that, hey, we understand this segment really well. So if none of us have ever done PLG before, and we're all, you know, in our entire careers, we've been doing enterprise B2B software sales. You know, if we're like, hey, let's do a PLG motion. Like, we've never done it. Like, it's not it's not as easy as you may read about in a blog post. And the same thing if you have a PLG experience and background as a founding team and be like, hey, let's start selling to the enterprise. Like, <laughs> it's uh, just stick to what you know really well and start to do that, do, do that well. Did you try doing PLG? No, we've never done the PNG, and uh, again, like it's not a core experience in our uh, sort of management team today. And we said that like un- until we have we have people that are you know have deep understanding of the PLG motion, we're not going to sort of uh, do that. Stick with what you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. L- l- let's talk about. You know, I want to go back to this thing about serving SMBs and enterprises and. One of the, the the challenges of of that is like how do you build the right product for two very different types of customers? I think, right? So was this a struggle for you guys? Oh yeah, man, it's still a it's still a struggle. You know, um, 
because at the end of the day, like it's about how do you prioritize your resources and resources are always limited. You don't have uh, you know, unlimited resources to, to, to serve both enterprise customers and smaller companies. So I, I feel that it's still a challenge with our company. Um, um, you know, as the years pass, we're sort of getting closer to picking lanes and saying no to business, uh, which is obviously hard to do, uh, especially if you have a, ba- a bootstrap background. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, it, it has a lot to do with the depth of the platform that you have, um, yeah, enterprise functionality, just build out the security layers and, and all, all, just all the things you need for enterprises, it just takes time to do. But once you've built it, and if you have a sort of modular platform where you can sort of make it be also easy to use and, uh, is fit for smaller companies. Uh, if you can, I mean, then you can obviously serve both. Um, but that's that's just on the product and product side, right? I think that it's an equal big challenge on the go-to-market sides. If you have, uh, say, salespeople that again, like, have a enterprise background, enterprise sales motion background, to hire those people and say, hey, go out and sell ten, twenty thousand dollar contracts, like that, that's that's hard. And the same thing if you have very transactional sellers in the business. Saying that, hey, go and chase this big, uh, you know, public company. I think that that's equally hard. So, so getting these things right is, I think it's, uh, I think for us at least, it's still something that is uh, hard that we struggle with. How do we organize the teams? How do we package the product? How do we charge for different things? How do we let people, companies that are fast scaling, to scale with us? You know, and maybe bring them on board, even though they're small. Um, and and yeah, just just be able to sort of. Um, live up to the promises that we make to both big and small companies. It, it's hard. I mean, somebody listening to this might be wondering, like, wh- why not just, like, what's holding you back from picking a lane, from just saying, like, we just go all in with SMBs or we just do enterprise? Like, can you just explain what the, what the, the challenges of that? It's a, it's a very good question, man. I, I mean, I when we have our management meetings at Planet, I ask the same question. We speak it in our board. Um, it's a very, very good question. <laughs> Um, I, I don't have a good answer to it, to be honest. Um, I think that there's two things why it's hard. One is that if you are successful with, I think, yeah, if you're successful with serving both segments, then it's hard to say no to one of the segments, right? So if you come to our, you know, if I come to your company, say, and I'm like, hey, Omer, like, forget about this segment. Just focus on this other one. You're like, hey, I'm doing well here. Why would I? Why would I stop? It's different if you're struggling as a business, right? And I'm like, hey, why don't you pick one of these lanes? It's it's hard to uh, do uh, well in both. So I think that that's one. The second thing is that at least for us, if you come from a bootstrap business uh, and bootstrap background, it's very hard to say no to business. You know. It's uh, theoretically, it's easy. It's easy in an Excel sheet to justify it, but like you're out there in the fight and somebody's there, they want to pay you say half a million dollars, but for some reason you can't serve that big company. Like it's hard to be like, oh no, you know, <laughs> it's not right for us. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, it's it's almost like it would be easier if you weren't doing well with one of those <laughs> segments, right? The decision is like- But but also just, just on that, I think another thing is that like, even though, you, and you know, what is doing well, you could always do better. You could argue that, hey, you would do better as a company if you actually picked a lane and just focused uh, even, even more. So that that's the other side of that, I think. Right. You mentioned the, the kind of the bootstrap mindset and, and kind of difficulty saying no to, to business. Completely understand that. Did you, uh, did you say at the beginning that you'd raised the 50 million, but pretty much most of that money was still in the bank? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the company is growing. You got a, you got a, what, like a couple of hundred people in the company, well funded, generating, you know, eight figures in revenue. Is that bootstrap mindset just with you and Nicholas, or, or do you still try to kind of create that as part of the culture in the company? Yeah, I think that uh, if we're trying or not, it is part of the culture in the company. You know, uh, early days, I say that like when you're bootstrapped, the good thing with being bootstrapped is that when you start out, you know, everything everybody ha- is doing has to create real value, you know, real value. 
If it doesn't, then you will die. Now, that, uh, and if you operate like that for many years and then, you know, get a big uh, sum of money in your bank account, that doesn't disappear over time, you know? It sort of becomes part of your culture. It becomes part of the standards you have for, for yourself and for each other that, hey, we're not going to have any people that in the business that's not creating value, that, you know, uh, we're just not going to be that kind of company. So uh, I would say that it's, yeah, it's, um, it's not from the founders, uh, but it's like it is how we operate, how we think about things. It's also core, if you think about the platform and the mission that we're at, right? We think that, hey, companies, there's like this big era where businesses are moving away from being promised things, you know, in this sort of sales-driven world to a, to a place where people will only pay you for the value that you actually deliver to them. See this in subscription business models and, uh, you know, consumption-based business models and whatnot. And, 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 and when you're operating in these business models, you have to create actual real value for the customer. And that means that, like, internally, you need to be value-driven. Um, so, yeah, it's a very core to the mission at hand, how we started the business, and how we just operate. And on that note, I think we should uh, wrap up and get onto the lightning round. So I've got seven quick fire questions for you. What's one of the best pieces of business advice you've received? Um, yeah, so I don't know if I have the, the best business advice, but I think a good advice is like, don't listen to advice, uh, especially from people that haven't done the things that you're trying to do. Uh, but so yeah, so anybody listening to this, like, you're on your own path. What may have worked for us doesn't work for anybody else. Like it's, yeah. Totally. And and I think, you know, having done like, you know, like over 400 of these interviews, it's like, it's amazing how you come across people who do, founders who do exactly the same things and get completely the opposite results from that. And so to be able to just say, go and do X, Y, Z because it worked for so-and-so is like, it's, it's a dangerous kind of, you know, thing to do. What book would you recommend to uh, our audience and why? Um, so I think um, I worked for a guy who recommended the, good, the book Good to Great by Jim Collins many, 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 many years ago. Uh, I think I still think it's a great business book. Um, you know, empirically speaks about sort of what sets great companies away apart from good companies. Um, I think it's a great book. I haven't read it now for many years, I have to admit, but like, yeah, it's a good book. Cool. Uh, what's one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful founder? Uh, successful founder, I think you need to be very good at building teams. Uh, yeah, it's especially if you want to scale something. I think that's very important. It's obviously important that you are resilient and like that you that you stick to the things. But like, I think if you cannot build the teams, you're not a good team builder. It's harder than to build a successful company. What's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Uh, I don't have any productivity tools, but I uh, I say to all our employees as often as I can that they need to sleep well, eat well, and exercise every day. I do that myself. Um, I think that that's my best productivity hack. Cool. Uh, what's a new or crazy business idea you'd love to pursue if you had the time? Uh, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't have one. Um, I mean, I work. Plan, I'm very passionate about Planet, so I think it's the best thing ever. Uh, so I, I don't have one. And um, what's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? Um, I think your audience don't know that I used to be a fighter. I've been a Swedish champion in martial arts many times. I've been fighting for the national team. I've been, uh, I still fight. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm a good fighter. Wow. So, so like, it's something that you still do, like train seriously for, like even now, like while you're still running Plant Hat. Yeah, be, being a serious fighter uh, is hard uh, as you sort of get older. It's put it that way. Uh, it's not. Um, yeah, it, it's not like a lot of other sports, but yes, you. I still work at. You know, go to the gym. I still do martial arts. Yes, it's. Um, I do. It's just like it's definitely. It's. It's. It's all absolutely not at the same levels as uh, as earlier. And 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 what is this? Is this like taekwondo or was it? Is that what I came across? Yeah, I started out doing taekwondo. I do jujitsu. I've been doing muay thai. I've been doing a bunch of different sports. Wow. 
And uh, finally, what's one of your most uh, important passions outside of your work? Uh, so I have a family, I uh, have three kids, I have a dog, and um, yeah, as I said, I work out and I work at Planet. That's sort of my life. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. As long as you're yeah. happy. That's all that matters, yeah, right? Yeah, I am happy. <laughs> <laughs> really. Love it. Okay, Gavi, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure chatting. Uh, if people want to find out more about Plan Hat, they can go to planhat.com. And if folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, send an email or, uh, yeah, email is best. My first name at planet is, is a good one. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for making the time. Um, and I know it's a lot to unravel, uh, kind of going back almost uh, a decade and, uh, you know, distilling that down. But I uh, appreciate you doing that. And uh, congratulations on everything you've done so far, you and Nicholas and the team. And uh, I wish you all the best of success. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. My pleasure. Cheers.